You're listening to the AID Network. Hey friends, welcome to the start of a special Bricky's Guide to Breaking into Hollywood. If you're like me, you've always been obsessed with TV, cinema, just the idea of telling stories, making visual art for a living. It always seemed so exciting, but there was just one catch. I grew up in the border of Kentucky and Southern Indiana, not exactly Hollywood. It always seemed like these jobs were make-believe, and the people that had them were born into the industry. I could never see a way where I, from my Kentucky upbringing could find a way to break into Hollywood. Fast forward several years later, I now live in the Los Angeles area. I've been doing my podcast for over 800 episodes, and I've been fortunate enough to interview several people that work inside of the entertainment industry. Every time I interview them, it's a simple format. I treat everyone as if they're my friend. I treat everyone as if they're my coworker, and that helps me create a bond with them, a relationship with them, where I can always flip the switch and ask them how exactly did they break into Hollywood? This series of episodes are all put together, curated for you to give you a guide on how you can get through that firewall, how you can get on the other side and how you can get a job in the entertainment industry. I don't know all the answers, but I know how to ask all the right questions. Bricky's Guide to Breaking into Hollywood is brought to you by my sponsors, jackprince.com. Whatever it is that you want to make, whatever it is that you're trying to build, build it, make it great and build it with Jack Prince. That's jakprince.com slash circle of trust where you'll save even more off of low industry prices. T-shirts, stickers, printing, banners. If you're building something, they can help you do it. I start off the series with Han Fulistad. I think I got that right. We'll assume that I did. He's a filmmaker, but he comes from the background of music. The music industry was the first industry that I would call a full career. Same for Hans, but I've talked to him about how when you edit a film... It's like playing an instrument. I've gotten into YouTube. I've gotten into making some of my own short films. And I have to tell you, the editing to the music, the putting the story together, the figuring out an extra second of silence or when the beat comes in, it is just like playing music. In fact, it's like playing music with others, but you get to do it by yourself. So Hans explained to me editing as an instrument and how what you do with your other careers you bring into the career that you choose to do for passion, for love. All the little dumb jobs we have, they all build towards that that character that helps us create what it is that we're supposed to. Hans shares with us how you follow the story. He's made different documentaries about the Sunset Strip, about Bob Moog, the inventor of the synthesizer, and he said he lets the story guide him along the way to tell him how to make a story loud, how to make a story quiet, I found that to be interesting that the actual art itself dictates the style guide that he follows. But this is about breaking into Hollywood. How are you going to break in with just hearing about all this stuff? Aha, don't worry. I asked him about how the funding on an independent film works. Like, When do you get the money? How do you live off of it for three years? I mean, it would be pretty privileged just to go off and make a movie for three years. That's going to take money. If you're a responsible human being and you live in America, that's easily ninety to $150,000 of living money. And then you got to make this film. He explains to us how he got the funding, how you live off of it. What I'm going to drop for you now is a small sample from the interview. The episode ran about an hour and a half. This is a little 25-minute segment to hear the entire episode and the entire series. I've only put together 10 of these, but when I was going through the archives, there was over 25 different episodes, and that was me ignoring the music industry. So this is one of 10. Enjoy the small sample. If you'd like to hear the whole thing, visit my website, AIDpodcast.com. Become a member of the Circle of Trust where you get the bonus content every day and you unlock the archives. The next episode when we come back from our break is episode 812. When you become a member, you get access to all that great content. Interviews just like today, trying to make you laugh, trying to entertain you, but trying to show you the path. I know you're just like me. There's something great inside of you. There's something you want to build. How do you get there? We'll get there together. That's the first step. That's how. It's Han Fulestad breaking, Bricky's Guide to Breaking into Hollywood. Breaking, Bricky, Breaking into Hollywood. I need to come up with a better name, but we'll get there. Enjoy today's sample. 
Go to AIDpodcast.com, become a member of the Circle of Trust. Yeah, it did. It did take a different kind of focus. You know, it's like one of those things. If you think too hard about it, it it starts to fall apart or something, you know, which is music, right? Because if if you and I are are jamming right now and playing music and you start thinking about what you're doing, then it all falls apart. It's that instinctive nature that I know that, you know, that we're getting ready to go into the next part. Yeah. And then we know that we've done this now, you know, like, have you ever counted like, Oh, this is the seventh measure and one more, like it's an instinctive thing. And when I looked at that movie, I'm like, this is a musician sitting in front of all of his toys being like, boom, this is the next piece, you know, like, cause you couldn't plan out something that has that many moving pieces. I mean, there must be 10,000 shots in this film. Yeah. So to like, think about all that like there's no storyboard that can keep up with that much data at some point like that instinct of a musician just has to jump in and take over it's true it's it, and it, even more than than music like improvising yeah like they're they're so yeah you don't you don't watch your hands too closely you don't kind of get out of the zone you kind of get into the zone uh when you're editing in a very similar way as when you're performing on stage yeah and you instinctively just know that you know the contour of this line that I'm about to play through my sax is going to go this direction up and down and you know, whatever. And you just know which, what, what feels right. And when I'm cutting, um, and I'm in the zone, then, you know, remembering the, the smallest detail from an obscure clip that I hadn't seen for months or something, you know, and, uh, and remembering right where it, where, it, what, uh, where it, where it lives and right. and right where it needs to be. And, and you start of start conducting like all of these little moving pieces. And when you're in the zone and when you start, you see it starting to fall into place, it's like, it does feel a lot like, you know, like playing, like performing music. Well, I would have to say, I know you, you know, no, no parent likes to pick between their children. Right. But if I had to pick the most important form of the arts or the most appreciated, it's got to be music because music is added to all films. It's added to everything visual. There's always music in there. And in fact, one of the most powerful things a filmmaker can do is to not use music. Like the decision in indie films to, to do it scoreless, that's when music is its loudest, really, when you're like, whoa, this feels so crazy. Why does this film so crazy feel so crazy? Oh, because there's no music. And that is the power of music. And if you look at it, like little kids don't instinctively try to make movies or paint. But in when they can barely stand up in their crib, you put on any music and a, and a baby sort of bounces, you know? And any person that gets famous in one form of the arts they always still would like to be Keith Richards. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah, it's Johnny true. Depp, like look at his yeah, career. Yeah. At the end of the day, he'd trade it all to be a rhythm guitar player and a good rock and roll band, you know? So I think that starting with music, and music was sort of the first art that I found as well. I think when you've got that music in your back pocket, you see the world in a different sort of way because music's about collaboration. It's about keeping yeah. sort of a time together. And, you know, to do the film that you did and to manage that many relationships, that's a guy that's obviously played well with others. You know, like you can't go in there being a, a I mean, you can be an asshole, but you have to have a certain amount of clout before you can go to asshole dumbness. You know, <laughs> that's my term. But being a musician, like you obviously learn how to get in there and jam with these celebrities and like, you know, I'll ask them a couple of questions. We'll work our way up to the bridge. And now when it's really going and the conversation's flowing, so Johnny, tell me about River Phoenix passing away in front of the Viper Room. You know what I mean? Like, I, I kind of just felt like it had a composer's thumbprint all over it. Mm. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I suppose that that's. I mean, I suppose that that's true. I mean, I hadn't. I mean, music is different for me also um, from from other uh, media, other art forms. Um, and I think one of the thing that makes it maybe like dance or something, yeah. that there's something so, uh, innate and some, something so like, it feels like blood circulating or air, you know, breathing air or something. There's, yeah. there's something very fundamental about it. Yeah. Um, and, and there's something very fundamental about movement too and dance, you know, if there, it seems like, 
Um, well, don't get me wrong. I'm anti-dancing. I, I want to <laughs> okay. live in that footloose town where they outlaw dancing. I'm totally against dancing, but I love music. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, I don't know if you can breathe film the same way you can breathe music. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's just a different set of things entirely. Um, and so since, uh, you know, the, you know, 30,000 year old cave paintings and, and this long, long music tradition, uh, across the world. I mean, all of these elements find them their way into film. Um, so you do have the, the gathering around the campfire telling stories. You do have the music, you have, um, sex and comedy and, you know, you have every kind of story and, and it's at the end of a day, like a little flickering light in, in a darkish room, you know? And, and so it, it, the film takes a lot of its power from those same kinds of fundamental forms. I yeah. Think, you know, so like, like music and like dance and storytelling and, and, um, and so, yeah, so I, 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 I think that doing films about music just makes that even one step even more clear, Yeah. you know, from, from a filmmaker point of view. So when you did your film, uh, Moog, uh, about Bob Moog and the invention of the Moog mm -hmm. synthesizer, which was, I mean, fascinating to really have this crazy old guy explain the science that's inside of that and to understand that they were handmade in the beginning. You know, when he talked to his sales rep in New York City, yeah, yeah. And he was like, oh man, like, you know, we could only really sell these to like the, the you know, the, the studios and the movie house or the music houses and stuff. And sort of thinking about, you know, getting back to MTV. I mean, so much of that music was like synth influenced and you're going back, you know, pre all that technology and and learning about this from Bob Moog himself and coincidentally the film releases he ends up passing away yeah. you know not yeah. too far after that so it's kind of like you caught this man's legacy and life story like you know right when he'd probably had the most amount of living to share with somebody but the pacing in that film is crazy different than Sunset Strip yes it is yeah. so is that intentional or are we seeing like a guy who's a musician dabbling around in video and kind of figuring it out? Like, what do you think the relationship is between how one movie is very slow and stays the course and very information heavy, but then you do another movie that tells 10,000 stories at once. So it's like the same amount of data just totally produced in a different way. Like, what are we seeing here? Is it the learning curve or an intentional decision? Well, the, the, for me, the story itself um, kind of manifests all of those differences. So, yeah. so it's just planting a different seed and, and, and then, you know, enjoying the fruit of that, yeah. you know, of that tree. Um, because, I mean, Bob's film was essentially about um, him and, and, and talking about his history to some degree, but mostly talking about how he feels about his history. And mostly it's talking about how he feels when he's creating something, when he's inventing something, when he's building something. Um, it was a little bit sort of a more metaphysical kind of area that I was attracted to with that story. Yeah, like the emotion yeah. you and I might get from playing that guitar over there in the corner. Yeah. It felt like he got that same like emotional charge from math and science and like actually building those boards and like, you know what I mean? When he yeah, would talk for sure, when Absolutely. he would talk about science, yeah. it sounded like you and I talking about like, you know, Oh man, the way the drums meet up with the guitar. Well, you know, there. cause he can envision it. He can imagine that level of reality in his, in he his, was a in genius, his mind. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and it has an affinity for electronic circuits in a way that, that, you know, he's he sees the way the electricity is moving through those circuits in the same way that we might see like a vibrating guitar string. See, right. So he understands it at a certain level where he is seeing this thing as uh, a classical musical instrument. Yeah. You know, he's seeing it the same as a violin and choosing just the right piece of wood for that violin or something. You know, and and so I think when when uh, a person like him understands electronics in that way, it's all poetry yeah you know and and that sounds a little weird to people that maybe aren't so into math and science but but uh, a lot of um you know mathematicians a lot of scientists and researchers do develop this poetic relationship with their with their modality you know or whatever like with with a a beautiful formula yeah or something you know um so so yes he had that 
for electronic circuits, and he was able to translate that for musicians right. so that they could actually use it. But that, to me, all of that choosing film, as I mentioned before, uh, as opposed to digital video, um, the the form and the style kind of grows out of very organically out of the subject matter. Um, Sunset Strip was never going to be a small looking film because it's Sunset Strip. How could you do that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm making a quiet so, movie about Times Square in Manhattan. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, so so a lot of a lot of that I try to stay very open and and receptive to what the project su- suggests yeah. to me. You know? Yeah. So it, it tells me kind of what it wants to be. And it's and it's, you know, not super cryptic. I mean. You know, I know Bob and his work very well, and I know, you know, the Sunset Strip history very well. You know, so it's not, you know, super hard to kind of divine what what the best kind of format to to hang that that content in. I immediately got on both of these projects, and this is what I always talk about on the show. You want to be a consumer to the product that you're making. So I could obviously see your love of sunset or your, or your love of Bob and, and his invention, you know, and I could tell that you were making it for you by the questions that were made and the, the mm. way that you build these stories, you know, something I've learned in life and I, I kind of learned it. Um, I think faster than most people do is that when you're stuck at a party or in a social situation that even though old people look really scary because their faces are dropping and melting and they're like intimidating creatures. <laughs> yeah. You talk to an old guy about his life. It is the best conversation you'll ever get into. And my wife's uh, grandfather on her mom's side, this fucking guy, Vince files. He is a fascinating guy. None of his grandkids ever ask him anything about his life. I'm like, Tell me about being a fire chief in the city of Buffalo, New York for three decades. Like, what's the craziest thing you saw? And he's telling me a story about going to a house where a guy cut off his hand to try to get attention from his ex-wife, you know? And I'm like, so what do you do with the hand? Like, like how much blood is coming out? Yeah. And he would just give me every detail with, with hanging out with Bob, dude, old guys, when they're, when they're kind of wrapping it all up, I I mean, the stories he gave you were so fast and loose and old people don't really self edit when they speak, you know, like, was it a pleasure just sort of being around him and just getting like every bit of raw data? That, that was also part of the good timing, I think too, or good or fortuitous timing, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, because he did pass away, you know, not much more than a year after the film came out. Um, he did get to see the movie, right? He did. Yeah. We, did he we, like we, it? We, yep. Yeah. yeah. He thought it was weird. He's very humble and kind of, you know. Yeah. He wouldn't take credit for his invention. No, he, he's not the spotlight type, type guy. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, but anyway, but he, he, but he enjoyed it. He saw the value in it. And, um, uh, but another thing with the timing is that I think if I had spent time with him maybe 20 years before, I would have gotten much more of an engineer, you know, kind of a much less poetic Bob. Yeah. I Cause think. he's so, able to look at it. Yeah. at sort of the finish line. And also he'd made his money. He'd made his mark in the industry. There's like with the old guys, there's not really that sort of competition anymore of a facade of success or whatever. Like, like when, when Bob, Mold, uh, Bob mold, <laughs> that's a whole other documentary. Mm-hmm. When Bob Moog gave you the breakdown about how he fell backwards on a banana pill yeah. into creating that. And he, you know, I, I met this guy to that guy. Like you kind of don't realize the randomness and the perfection of your life until you're at the moment where you can really look back on how all these crucial moments made yeah. the DNA of your life, you know? And, I, I love old guys. And so I knew from the opening scene of him sitting on his porch with four pins in his left pocket, I'm like, this is going to be my kind of documentary, you know, because I just, there's something about an accomplished life that's just fascinating. Yeah, I agree. And that moment when you yeah. had him on the stage in, in Manhattan and he's introducing some, you know, I think um, Emerson Palmer or whatever. Keith Emerson, yeah. Yeah. Who's also passed. This has been a really awful year to be a music legend. Yeah, you're, you well. Yeah. Is it though? Because that here's the thing: like all of the icons are getting some age on them, so it's gonna just seventeen is gonna be worse than sixteen, you know? Because yeah, the kids from the sixties, well, they're now in their seventies, and it's gonna just keep happening, you know? And and the problem is, is we don't have 
modern day icons to take their places because everything is so disposable, you know? So I don't know if this is a bad year or if this is just, we're hitting that moment where it's going to be really bad for a while. And then we're going to be like, Fuck. Oh, I'm, I'm sure you're right. All the icons sure are gone, you're right. you know, because we're, we're just hitting that, that, yeah, we're just hitting that first kind of mile marker of, yeah. you know, I think you're right. But it, I mean, but, but I mean, but, Bowie and print. I mean, mm. it is especially crazy yeah, though. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, like there's something going on. It's it's going out with a bang. Like this yeah. this whole thing that we're going through. It, it's going hardcore at first, but when um when Bob was on stage, yeah, just kind of being like a weird intellectual guy talking on a microphone, which is always one of my favorite things to watch. He's like. I should stop talking now because he like kind of bombed on a joke and the crowd was like, no, we love you. <laughs> yeah, and like, yeah. th- like you could literally tell that the type of people who go to that concert understand, you know, when you s- see the rack uh, that the guy was playing with all the wires going in everywhere, it's like, what kind of mad genius would know all those patch cords and cables and everything? You know, like one of my favorite things about guitar players is looking at their pedal boards because it's like, what kind of mad fucking scientist figured out that all those pedal boards mm-hmm. you know is their sound you know and it's like so when he was up there speaking you could just tell that he was in a club full of people that appreciated you know this sort of master nerdum that, that he had come up with you know that literally stretching a bandwidth from this point to that point is going to make this sort of sound and if this knob bends that frequency then we hear that difference i mean it, I felt smarter after watching that movie, and I'm not a smart man, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> so here's my question for you. You've done two movies that are very much about outsiders and rebels. I mean, I know that you've done more, but I've sort of boiled it down to focus on these two. There's a, a major common thread between Bob and the Sunset Strip. I mean, the Sunset Strip in its essence was where people went to get out of town, to go be outlaws, to get outside the long arm of the law. Bob Moog, same personality, really, you know, in in a very intellectual and science type way. So is this a common theme? Is, Is Do you see yourself this way? Is this something that you're attracted to? Do we expect more projects like this from you? Uh, I mean, it's it's a fascinating area to kind of look at. Um, you could also kind of think of it like um, just finding an extreme case of something that you're, that you're interested in. I'm yeah. interested in in creativity, the nature of creativity. I'm interested in in improvisation. I'm in, interested in 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 all of these different kind of you know aesthetic uh, and artistic genres and modalities. And and when you take uh, an aspect of that and place it in an extreme environment, sometimes it can kind of you can get a just a different look at uh, yeah a different look at it and just kind of you know turn it around in your mind a little differently and so uh bob is very extreme in what he did in terms of kind of creating something that was not there before and And being shunned for it in the beginning yeah and and going through decades of kind of ups and downs business wise yeah and uh all else um but at the end of the day, creating a sound and an instrument that has uh, defined certain kinds of music and certain artists. You know, we'd, there, there would just be huge, huge, huge absences from the catalog if you took the Moog synthesizer out. Absolutely. You know? um, so that's a version of an extreme case, you know. So now after this guy's 70... What does he think about all this? Like, how does he really, when he wakes up in the morning, what is, I, I was kind of more interested in that. There's some great books that you can get all the details of all the, the history of the invention of the synthesizer. But just him saying, yeah, I, I wake up in the morning and I do this gardening and I do this and then an ideal come to me and then I go over here and, you know, and how he feels about his life and his accomplishments yeah. and, and his goals for his future and all that. That's fascinating to me, Yeah, you know? Um, and, and also you do have a guy that, that, you know, is 70 and was there front and center for a lot of some of the more, you know, significant, or at least to me, like important kind of musical milestones and, um, you know, since the sixties. And so anyway, it, 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 it was just a fascinating kind of world to inhabit and being a documentarian, you can kind of just go visit and be kind of immersed in a place or a time or, you know, a group of people. How long did you work on that film for? 
Uh, that one was about uh, a little more than three. Yeah, about three years. And then what um, about Sunset? How Sunset long? Strip about the same. How do you how years. do you fund your life while you're working? Is this a part time job for three years, like fitting it in the the dead spaces in your schedule? Uh, or is it a full time gig for three? No, years? it's it's full time. Wow, the, the Sunset Strip was. Uh, Moog wasn't. Okay. Um, but uh, but uh, yeah, when I say like the two or three years, I mean that's after we get you know funded or whatever. That's after we get the support. That's when you so, start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so th- that actually is just actually working on the film, and most of the work comes in the. Uh, in the editorial and the post-production side. Yeah. You know. So do you shoot all of that in a year and then spend two years putting it together? Or are you still shooting right up to the end? Cause you, you, you find more people. You, you try to wrap, you know, but I mean, it just, it doesn't ever work out that way. So yeah. you're always going to be picking up bits and pieces, even though you're almost done with the whole edit, you know? So if, so. if you get funded, right? You're like, mm. Oh, we got funded. We're going to do this movie. Do you look at that money and then divide it up and go, okay, I think if I give myself this much, I can live off of this for two years and then it goes three years. Like how does sort of, how does that financially work for an artist when you, when you get funded? But I mean, dude, three years living in LA, it's a lot of money. Yeah. Well, it, it's a little bit more um, formal than that. Uh, there are contracts and, yeah. and there are budgets. And, yeah. And uh, so you kind of negotiate all of that kind of up front. I mean, everybody kind of knows what they need to make. Of course. Year, you know, to, but do you get it in one lump so. sum or do you get draws from the account after you get a certain amount of work done? Uh, usually it's, uh, yeah, usually it is uh, dispersed in, in chunks, mm-hmm. like larger chunks. Um, but it depends on the production, depends on the, on the budget and the schedule. Yeah. Um, I've had much, much larger chunks of money, um, become available when we only have, you know, five or six months to finish this particular thing or we have, we're shooting, you know, so the schedule determines a lot, Yeah. you know, in terms of, of, of where the money's going. When, when you work in that type of ecosystem, you know, and all right, I just got, a deposit in my account and I know that I've got enough money to live off of for the next six months. Is that a great place to be as an artist where you can literally just put your head down and just get lost in the work and not have to send invoices and chase jerks down for payments? Like, is that a good spot to be in as a creative? Yeah. I mean, obviously for obvious reasons, it, it's, it's, it's great. And it's, 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 um, liberating to not have to worry about just the that di- big just, part of life is calm. Yeah. For, for a short time. At least, you <laughs> it know? comes back. <laughs> yeah. It'll, it'll come back. Yeah. Um, but I, I have noticed though that, that obviously I would prefer that to the, the hustling. Yeah. But, um, I mean, most people would, but I do get an, a certain amount of energy from the hustle. The hustle keeps you honest. Yeah, and 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 I like that energy, and I like that sharpness. You know, when you're really like, it's it's f- the famine cycle of the feast or famine. You know, and that hunger, man. Yeah, and yeah. and so sometimes I do like a, you know, I don't know, like a, maybe like <laughs> with a gambler, like the the most like beautiful moment for a gambler is like when they lose big yeah you know because now they have to build it all back up again and then yeah. start the whole thing this is the last the time process, i'll be in this spot you know? this is yeah. the last time yeah. this will happen to me i've said that a million fucking times yeah but it always happens again because i am that gambler i'm like oh i think i can get a little bit more out of this yeah exactly like, I'm and, sweating and that talking energy about it right is now. good yeah, yeah that that yeah. that energy is really productive and and can be great so, yeah so i i appreciate that while also appreciating the feeling of peace when you know you've got a cushion you know to to pay the bills for a while when you're out hustling you know when when you're composing and you're working on projects that are month long versus three years long you're you're putting more out into the world right so you're putting more hooks out in the water you're going to catch more fish when you work on something for three years and you kind of go off the radar is there a bit of fair uh, a bit of fear of well, what am I doing to catch more work? You know what I mean? Like when, yeah, when you disappear yeah. for that long, that's kind of a huge gamble. Like, well, would the world still care about me when I come out of my rabbit hole in three years versus like right now, if you've got 16 projects going on over the span of the next five months, I mean, that's a lot of fusion and energy to catch more. No, work. you're right. Yeah, you're right. You know, you can go off on a tour, go off on the festival circuit, go out on a production, 
uh, there's lots of ways that you can become kind of isolated. Yeah. And, and it is true. Sometimes you do kind of think, oh man, you know, I'm going to have to kind of reintegrate, but, uh, you know, kind of build up the network again. Yeah. But, but I've also noticed, um, uh, that was kind of surprising to me that opportunities tend to come to me almost more readily when I'm unavailable. Hey friend, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Hans Fulestad. Sounds good, right? The faster you say it, the more self-confidence, the more right it sounds. Hope you enjoyed this interview. The full thing is available over at our website, AIDpodcast.com. To hear it, you have to become a member of the Circle of Trust. But don't fret. I'm going to be dropping nine more of these 10 days in a row, a series of Bricky's Guide to Breaking into Hollywood. I was just like you. It felt intimidating, but my dreams are real. My dreams must be validated. You and I, we can work hard together and we can make that happen. Thank you, Han Fulestad, for sharing your story, for sharing all about your filmmaking, and for sharing the financing. There's a lot more business talk in the full episode. Find it today over at AIDpodcast.com if you want to hear more, over 800 episodes to unlock, and I will see you here tomorrow with part two in our 10-part series, Bricky's Guide to Breaking In to Hollywood. I think that's the name. That's what we'll go with. Thank you for listening. Good day. Good design.